This weekend marks another debut of a partnership between the Albany Times Union and WMHT. We're pleased to have join us in studio Paul Grondel, a top-notch writer for the TU and an author of a number of books. Paul, it's good to have you back. Thank and you. WMHT producer Nicole Van Slake. The Dragon Lives Here is the name of the multimedia project that probes the heroin epidemic in the capital region. Let's take a look at a preview. Once you push the pen just a little bit, bliss. I don't know, you can't even say it. You're just free from everything. And then you come back to reality, and then you're just there. I robbed a bank. How do I explain that to people? Sometimes if it's bad enough of an overdose, we'll put them on an Narcan drip and admit them, which they hate. The last 10 years or so, working in a suburban community like this, I saw an increasing number of local children that I watched grow up. And next thing you know, they're mainlining heroin. Give us a little bit behind the scenes. How were you able to first track these stories down, uh, some of the ones that we saw in this, in this preview? It, it took a lot of um, very sensitive uh, calling of families. Mm -hmm. It started showing up as uh, deaths in our obituary pages of young people, cause uh, undisclosed. And we started thinking it may be right here in mm -hmm. our uh, local communities. And, and many parents were not ready to talk about it, but we finally found some willing to share their difficult stories. Mm -hmm. Our uh, colleague Casey Seiler did a story on the heroin epidemic last year for us here on New York at Now. And we interviewed someone that you uh, kind of profiled as well, a woman from the Albany area. Her daughter did really well in school, was great socially, had a lot of friends. And she described that you know she she tried heroin once and then she was just hooked. Yes. And she talked about how it, she tried to get sober so many times, but it was so addictive she almost had no chance. Do, do you come across a lot of that? Yeah, that's very common. It's a different form, a different potency of heroin that was here in the early 70s, mm -hmm. and it's also striking a much younger, uh, more affluent, more suburban clientele than it did in the 70s, mm -hmm. and it's it's a killer. There's been many fatal overdoses just in our region, statewide, mm -hmm. nationwide. It's It's a national problem. Nicole, let's, uh, Paul's the print side, you're on, on the television side, the producer. Um, for TV, you need to see faces and, and, and hear voices. How difficult was it to get people to, you know, it's one thing to talk to a, maybe a print reporter, you know, maybe you can hide your face or not have a picture at all. Television, it's a lot different. How are you able to, to get people to tell their story on camera? Uh, it takes a lot of trust to get people to talk to you, but the people who are struggling and want to help other people out are the ones whose stories we've been able to tell. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the addicts that are in recovery right now are very willing to help out other addicts right now. That had to be a, a little surprising. What, what was your thought process going in there? That, you know, how, of the 10 people you asked, how many would, would actually agree to this? Were you surprised at how many did? Yeah, I think Paul did a lot of the legwork, so they were they felt like they were in good hands when I approached them. Mm -hmm. um, for the most part, people were willing to talk. If they had already talked to Paul, they mm -hmm. were willing to talk to me. We've seen local and statewide officials really try and, and address this problem, whether it's a task force from the Assembly or the State Senate. Both of them have been active. Attorney General Eric Schneiderman has done a lot with this, including with local police departments. Heroin has been around for a long time, as you mentioned earlier. I mean. People have been overdosing for years and years, yet it's just in these last couple of years where it seems like it's an epidemic. Right. Um, why is that? Is it because it's, it's becoming uh, more prevalent in the affluent areas, like, like you said, here in the Albany area, it's showing up in places like a Gilderland or Colony or North Colony, Clifton Park, places that might not have seen this uh, 10, 20 years ago? I think it came on very quickly and the numbers are, are very large and it's striking across a much different population than than other street drugs had before and certain lethal street drugs these are drugs are also cut with more dangerous substances and um, when you see a lot of young people dying bright talented with unlimited potential it gets people's attention and there's a lot of frustration in law enforcement they can they can arrest uh, low-level deal dealers and take some of the heroin off the street but 
some criticism is leveled at the federal government. What are they doing to stop the ultimate supply side? Right. Um, it was coming from Afghanistan several years ago now. It's primarily from Mexico, and uh, it's hard to track and stop at the source. And, and in one of the video pieces you see that we have up online is that you see how just how cheap it is. Right. And that's, uh, I guess, that, that's a, one of the reasons why it's so prevalent. It, it dropped, and it's also, you know, addicts will find the cheapest, most readily available substance. The, the common theme that we heard in these stories were uh, people who came, had an injury of some sort, some kind of uh, hospitalization, were legally prescribed painkillers, oxycodone, oxycontin, highly addictive, they got addicted to those. They were able to find them on the street. They had a street value. The price got very expensive when New York State passed a law to control the supply of those. They were being overprescribed. And then these people were addicted to opioids, and the next form that they could find was heroin. Cheaper, easier to get. Um, oxycodone, oxycontin pills were going for $20, $30 a pill. The supply of heroin became so prevalent, it went from $12 a bundle, or rather a, a pack, uh, to ten dollars to eight, and now it's as low as six dollars. Uh, and one pack would often be similar to one or two oxycontin pills, to, enough to get high. Nicole, you, we were talking off camera a little while ago, um, and I was not familiar with this. You said that the heroin is cut with a lot of different, a lot of different substances. Kind of describe what what, what that means. Uh, I think they. I'm not a chemist, but mm -hmm. I think that they cut the drug so that it will have different effects. And it, there's fentanyl that they cut it with, they cut it with NyQuil, they cut it with all sorts of different things um, to get a different high off of the drug and so that different addicts can get different effects when they shoot it up. We went with the Albany County Sheriff's investigators and they did a bust on a Central Avenue apartment, very ordinary apartment on the next to a busy street. The, uh, the person doing the dealing had small children who were playing on their tricycles outside his apartment. Mm -hmm. And they went in and his kitchen table was full of thousands and thousands of dollars of raw heroin. And he was just mixing it with, I think he might have even been using, you know, talcum powder or other substances, just mixing it on his kitchen table. These are not sanitary you know, laboratory conditions. These are street drugs that are very dangerous. I guess um, when they talk about a bad batch, uh, an emergency room, I guess that's what, that's what it kind of, kind of means. You know, these things aren't sanitary in a lot of cases, and that kind of leads to these, these batch of, of death. And they also, you know, some addicts that, that we've interviewed were using heroin for years and years. And they thought they knew a level that would get them high without mm -hmm. becoming lethal or fatal. And then all of a sudden they get a much more potent uh, pack and it, it can be really lethal. I guess uh, finally I'll ask, and Paul, I'll d direct this in you and Nicole, you can chime in as well. Uh, I gotta imagine for parents, it's, it's so difficult in the sense that when you have a child that keeps falling into the same pattern, at some point you've gotta ask yourself, you know, when do I let go out of love? I'm sure that's something that you've, you've probably come across in, in your stories. Yeah, we've told some of those stories. I mean, parents initially don't want to believe. Who wants to believe their child is addicted to heroin, shooting it into their arms? Secondly, the deception and lies across the board, you know, so they need the drug. They don't have money. They've lost their job. They're not doing well in school, so they start stealing. And in many cases, they stole everything from their parents, electronics, family heirlooms, lied about it. Some parents that we interviewed, you know, finally just said no more, mm -hmm. changed the locks on the door, would not let the, the kid back in, and, mm -hmm. and that's a difficult thing for any parent. And Nicole, you, I think you guys followed uh, around the gentleman who was talking about, you know, he seemed like a, a perfectly well-adjusted uh, guy in his 40s who had a decent job. He was talking about robbing a bank, and it mm -hmm. just, he couldn't believe that he reached that level. Yeah, I think that the drug makes you do anything to get access to it. There is another gentleman that we interviewed who said that the only reason he was able to eventually get clean is because he was in solitary confinement in prison. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different things that make people bottom out, but mm -hmm. I think the drug has a lot more power than we give it credit for. Well, it's a powerful series and we appreciate you both coming in and telling uh, telling your stories. Paul Grondel from the Times Union and our own Nicole Van Slyke from WMHT. The series starts online this Sunday, October 11th. Head to the website wmht.org slash dragon.